And welcome back to the Thinking Nick podcast. I'm your host, Nick Daniels. Today, we have a fellow South African on board. He is a software engineer and founder of Code Express, a technology company which specializes in the building of software applications, data analytics, and SEO. The reason why he founded Code Press was to provide his clientele with the ability to have a technical partner to fit all facets of their business rather than just to create a software application. So, Dominic, welcome to the Thinking Nick podcast. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for having me, man. Absolute pleasure. So for the rookies like myself or anyone who doesn't really know, let's start real simple. And could you just give us a brief description of exactly what software development is? Cool. So, I mean, I think if you, if you sort of like have to look it up in Google, they will like give you a definition of something along the lines of creating, testing, um, well, designing, creating, and testing a software application. That's sort of like layman terms, broad of, of what software development is, but it is unique per different clients. Um, so different clients have different needs, different software applications have different needs. So yeah, um, the long and gist of it is that, you know, it is a process by using different tools to create a software application, but there's multiple steps that we'll, I'm sure we'll unpack in, in just a bit as well. Yeah, as soon as you said processes, that was literally my next question I was going to ask. So what are the steps involved in software development then? So each company has got their own sort of unique flavor, you know, what works for them, what works for their for their clients, um, as well as, you know, Code Express, we have our own sort of like flavor as well. So the layman methodology is that you have, like, I think it's five steps. You've got requirements gathering, you've got design, building, testing, and then deployment. So that's sort of like the software life cycle, if you, if you want to call it. And, you know, us at Code Express, we sort of, we use that similar type of process and methodology, but it revolves around the three different teams that we've got. So we've got the software development team, we've got the data analytics team, and then we've got the SEO and marketing team. So, you know, if a client comes to us with an idea, we sort of take the data related to that idea, the requirements gathering, if you will. We take that off to the data analytics team. They process it. They run the numbers. They give us the projection, the projections. They have a look at the niche, um, all the different metrics that they use. Then we go back to the clients and we say, look, this is what we came back with. We think this idea can potentially hit this market, hit that market, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, if the client's happy and we've evolved from that process, we go on to the marketing side of things and the design side of things. So that sort of like runs in parallel. And it's quite cool, you know, because of the data and the niche that the client wants to go into, we can, you know, use certain colors that appeal to a certain type of demographic, et cetera. So design and marketing go, go in parallel. And then, you know, we go into the software development process, which then, you know, has its building and testing and its own set of criteria. And then that cycle just constantly evolves. So a, a software project really jumps around our three different um, teams quite often. So it's very unique that we've got access to, to everyone. Epic. So with the new business that me and my partner have uh, recently started, we've been trying to outsource some stuff like SEO and sort of like uh, social media management and stuff like that. And we've been looking on platforms like Fiverr and Upwork and there's obviously heaps of people on there that are freelancers and they do all these various different, you know, skills. Well, they have all these various different skills and you can employ them. So the next question I wanted to ask you was like, if I was, for example, just to quit my day job, if I had a day job and I wanted to become a freelancer, but I wanted to go into software development, what skills would I need in order to become a software developer? Cool. So now that technology has evolved, you know, because of COVID, everyone has, I feel like there's been a shift in lifestyle, you know, the work from home lifestyle, the, you know, everything going online, if you will, we are starting to see, you know, even in, in Code Express as well, we're starting to see um, people coming in with like non-technical, non-coding backgrounds, and they're doing a boot camp for like six, nine months boot camp, 
they learn the basics and they you know want to give tech a, a good go so there's two folds there's two you know umbrellas of skills that you sort of need so the one obviously being the tech skills which is massively important the programming the um you know if you're going into networking you obviously your networking solution tech skills so there's that side of it which you can evolve into different programming languages you know web development mobile development etc and then there's things that often engineers don't take into account which is your softer skills so like your team collaboration your communication skills your need to constantly learn and evolve which is extremely important especially if you you know want to get into freelancing and, and want to go into contract work your team collaboration and your communication skills is 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 pretty vital so I would say those two facets, those two umbrella skills are, are, are very, very important. Great, great, great insight there. So I've just spent the last six months, I can only speak from my own experience. I've spent the last six months developing a website with our website developer. And I've learned a lot about the back end. We've used WordPress and she uses a plugin called Divi. And I know there's another plugin called Elementor, but now these are your sort of drop and drag user-friendly plugins. So it's been great for me because I can use this now and learn about Divi and Elementor when it, it, I don't need any code, basically. But I was chatting to a mate yesterday who has his own website web development business, and they purely code absolutely everything on the website. There's no plugin like Elementor or Divi. So from your experience and what Codex do, how do you go about developing application for like a mobile or a website? Are you using these plugins or using code? Like, how do you guys do it? And what's the best way? Sorry, what's the best way to do it? So, I mean, us, us at Code Express, what we, what we sort of, we pride ourselves on is that we are a bespoke software development company. So, you know, we have, you know, we have the ability to do WordPress sites and, and things like that for a client. The real niche that we specialize in is, you know, we build our platforms from scratch. We've got, you know, engineers that literally love code and they work in code and that's, that's what they want to do. So, you know, it depends on, on the client and it depends on the client's budget and it depends on the client's needs and what they potentially looking to, to try and do and build. So it's, you know, for example, you as yourself, if you're looking for something that's simple and easy to, to get hooked into, um, you know, something that, you know, you just need help setting up and, you know, you left to, you know, do everything yourself, then WordPress is, WordPress is definitely that right fit. But if you are looking for something more custom that WordPress won't facilitate, then that's when, you know, Code Express comes in. So it depends, you know, it depends on the requirements. It depends, you know, obviously if you're looking to go for a mobile app, you know, you're not going to get a drag and drop type of approach. You know, there's, there's multiple things that go into it. If you're looking for, um, you know, recently we had a client that came to us for their HR system and he wanted it built in a, in a mobile app form, just, you know, for ease of use, you know, clients can, not clients, uh, employees can book leave, you know, get that thing, that sick leave in very, very quickly. <clears throat> and he wanted that mobile approach. Could we have done that with, with WordPress or something, you know, for the web, or we could have built it on web for sure. But WordPress wouldn't have been able to to facilitate that, and because you went down that um, that mobile route, you you know you needed something more more custom. So if you just want something that's simple, like a static marketing site or a static blog, WordPress is is definitely your your go to. But something more custom, something more niche is is going to require some some engineering work. Nice one. So I've got two questions for you now. I'm going to think of an application called VLC and it's a video application. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's like a orange triangle cone and you can play movies uh, and audio and stuff through it. And I always remember using that in high school and it always used to give us issues. Like it used to have bugs and problems and issues. And so, so what I wanted to know is like, you guys are developing these websites and these apps. What do you do when the app stops working and how do you fix or debug it? Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like the Hollywood movies make it out to be, you know, there's not going to be that moment where you sleeping at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, you're going to get a phone call, you know, someone's hacked the mail, get up, you need to go there. Look, there are moments like that. I'm going to say there isn't, I mean, I've been in moments like that. It's, it's not, not you know, the nicest thing to go through, but there's things like that. It's, they do come across, but as an engineer, you know, your responsibility is to make sure 
or try your best to prevent those scenarios from happening. But they do happen. You know, we don't, you know, there's nothing that's perfect in this world. There's no such thing as a perfect system. Every engineer likes to think they've built a perfect system, but sometimes that's, that's not really the case. So, you know, each company and each team has different processes in place. You know, it's sort of like the, the, the fire escape in a building, you know, it's all different per building, et cetera. The same thing is different per software project. But if you take, um, an e-commerce project, for example, you know, a severe issue would be, you know, clients have loaded their cart with a bunch of stuff and they can't make payments. So that's a severe issue. If your team is big enough, each team will have different parts of, of uh, functionality that they focus on. And then if that's the case, you, you know, go directly to that team, see what the issue is, or, you know, if an engineer has worked on that feature, you, you know, they've got the domain knowledge. So you, you, you go and you, you go to them. It's, it's different, but you know, the part the whole sort of process is, you know, you start off by determining the severity of the issue. So, you know, how severe are we dealing with here? Is it like a little label that's, you know, causing some, some weird issue, we can get to it later on in the day. But if it's a payments issue, for example, like an e-commerce site, that's, that's severe. So you try and determine the severity of the issue. Then you sort of have a look and say, okay, can, you know, let's do the investigation and see, can we replicate this issue? Is it an issue that's environment specific or is it just fully across the board? If that's the case, then, okay, cool. Now we look at the code and see what has changed recently that could possibly cause that issue. Then you have a good little gander. It's sort of like, okay, well, there's two possible ways. I can fix it now, an easy, quick fix, get it up, get the users going again, or you roll back to a certain point in the code where that bug or that issue didn't occur. And then you sort of try and fix it and then go, go ahead with your, with your next fix. And yeah, those are, those are sort of like the two solutions that you try and go for. I mean, obviously you would want to try and get the websites or the application up and running as quick as possible. And there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of frantic. Everyone's coming with different ideas. You've got the clients on your back, you know, they want payments, they want this done. So there's a lot of different things, but sometimes you have to take a step back, put that, you know, maintenance banner on saying, Hey, sorry, we busy looking at things. Sorry about the inconvenience, buy yourself some time. And then, yeah, try and try and get at it as quickly as possible. And then the, the last sort of step, which everyone sort of forgets is it's a process that you know, you want to obviously avoid going forward. So, you know, once that whole production issue has, has been resolved, you have sort of like something called like almost like a post-mortem, which is quite weird to say, but you know, you, you have a meeting with all the engineers and you say, all right, you know, what went, what, what went wrong, what caused it, how can we prevent it? And you document the process. And then if that error ever happens again, you have the whole documented process and it'll help you get there faster to resolving it. So yeah, that's how we do things. Each company is different, but yeah, that's our flavor that works, that works for us. Nice. Yeah. It sounds like a very stressful job. And I know, I know the feeling because I know when my website's not working, I'm straight onto my web developer and um, she's amazing. So shout out to Uta. She's really, really good. So I appreciate your patience and your time, but we also, again, with the business, we, we also like to document all our process flows again, just exactly for the same reason that you do. So it's easy to just go back and, you know, see if it's the same error or the same bug or the same anything. It's just the same process to fix. So we touched on plugins. I've, I'm familiar with plugins and I'm pretty sure people around the world are pretty familiar with plugins, but I've learned a new thing in the last six months called an API. And my understanding of an API is basically like a piece of code that you can link some other application or website or something to your website, but it's different from a plugin. So can you explain how it's different and, and how, what is an API basically, and, and how does it work? An API is an application programming interface. That's like what an API stands for. The best way to describe an API is if you have to draw a diagram between two people having a conversation, like me and you, for example, there's myself, there's StreamYard that we're using, and then there's you. So what's helping us communicate together is StreamYard. So that in layman's terms can be thought of, as, of as, as an API. So an API is also a bridge like between two applications. So if you have a database that's got all your data 
and you have the client page that you, every single user is busy seeing or interacting with, you would use an API, which is a service, a piece of technology, some custom code that's been written that will allow you to access your data and present it back to the user. So it's just a bridge of communication between two applications. Yeah, that's kind of like the gist of it. <laughs> it's much, much, much bigger than, uh, than just a plugin, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that's a, that's a very good description, keeping it nice and simple, easy to understand for the listeners and for myself. And then the next thing, there's just so much that I've learned in the last six months, but the next thing is AI. This chat GPT has just blown out of proportion at the moment, like it's everywhere at the moment. So can you explain to the listeners what chat GPT is and sort of what's your take on AI and, and how you see it affecting the software or website industry going forward? ChatGPT, as far as I can understand from when I've read the documentation about it, it is an algorithm which presents information back to the user. So a lot of people think that, you know, ChatGPT is this massive sort of algorithm that is thinking about itself and it's learning and it's evolving. There is that facet of it, but basically ChatGPT is like a Google on massive amounts of steroids. It gives you information on a very, very great level. So for example, like when I was doing um, uh, content writing for, for a client of mine, I sort of, I was like, let's, let's test it out, right? Let's see how, how good it is. So I plugged in and said, you know, create a content that's persuasive to, you know, a user looking to purchase X, Y, and Z. And it spits it out. Yes, it's not exactly 100%. We still had to tailor it, but it, it saved us a lot of time from trying to think and, and, and write things ourselves. For example, I tried to use it on code the other day. So I tried to tell it to write me a piece of JavaScript to handle a simple request. It did it, but not just there yet. So look, it's great. It's application I think is, 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 you know, it's fitting definitely for the technological era that we are going into. And it's, it's great to see, you know, from, from a software engineering perspective, from a technological exp um, um, expectation, it's, it's great to see. So it's, it's also good to see that AI has evolved in a way where the public has access to it. And there is the possibility or capability of ChatGPT evolving its algorithm much more than just sort of gathering information. It, I do believe that it is learning behind the scenes. And that, you know, how do I feel about AI and machine learning? So it's, it's very exciting. Um, obviously it opens up a lot of doors, but at the same time, it's very scary. Obviously I can understand it from a software perspective and a machine perspective. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's great. It opens up the doors, you know, it's, it's, it's fantastic, but you know, it's still scary because how much trust are we going to put in the machine, you know, and I know I'm probably going to go on like Terminator route and, and things like that and human machines don't have the best sort of relationships, but, um, yeah, there's still that element that scares me about it. You know, one day will there be robots that do everything for us? Like, like an iRobot, for example. Yeah, possibly. And that does, that does scare me, but it excites me at the same time. So. Yeah. I've, I've heard lots of stuff about the future of AI and I even know now in restaurants and stuff, they've got robots serving tables and stuff. So it's, it's literally just a matter of time until. Yeah, um, jobs are going to be going out the window, but that also opens up opportunities for new jobs. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, we're ever evolving and changing. Okay, so then Dominic, what, I mean, AI is very exciting. We've spoken about AI briefly. I mean, I think we could probably speak about it for, for hours because there's just so much to talk about, but let's sort of uh, go back towards software development and bring it sort of back to the main topic. What's exciting for you about the future of software development? What's exciting at the moment, obviously AI um, and machine learning. I mean, I only, I dabbled with it when I was in college and there was sort of a module that allowed you to explore AI and machine learning even more. And recently I was doing research for my brother-in-law who's looking to go into computer science. Um, and I see that there's a whole AI and machine learning faculty now at the moment, which shows, you know, great growth in that. I also think that, you know, there's certain laws that have come about around data protection 
which is extremely, extremely important. I mean, we know about the whole Cambridge Analytica saga, the Donald Trump saga, the um, EU saga, you know, the Brexit, um, etc. So, you know, the laws around data and how we handle data and how we store data in terms of an engineering perspective is it's evolved and we've got certain laws around that, which is fantastic. And it's, it's good that we have those security measures in place. Not only that, the users are more skeptical about where they put their data. You know, not everyone's just signing up to a random website anymore. You know, um, not everyone's just allowing cookie policies to happen, etc. So people are becoming more conscious about that, which is, which is extremely, extremely good. Also the way that the mobile development market has emerged past 10 years, maybe it's, it's fantastic. You know, smartphones and iPads and tablets are expanding into huge amounts of capability and hardware. You know, people are replacing laptops with iPads, which gives mobile developers and mobile development, um, a great, great platform and opportunity to build bigger, um, systems. Definitely, you know, for us at code express, we, we going into the mobile market and that's, it's, it's fantastic. So I think those, those are the pretty much the most exciting things happening at the moment. Sure. Lots, lots of exciting stuff there, man. And obviously the, the journey that you've been on, no business is easy. And I'm sure building code express was very much the same. So I'll leave you with a double question. The first one is, you know, what were the biggest challenges for you with regards to, to getting code X up and running? And what advice would you give to anyone? whether it be an individual or an organization about what you've learned about software development in the process. So one of the big, one of the biggest challenges when I got into software development, you know, ignoring, you know, how I've, I've grown code express, you know, the biggest challenge is, you know, the trends within technology, you know, every single day. And I mean, every single day, something is changing, you know, there's some new technological advance that's happened. There's some new. GDPR change that's happened, cookie policy that's changed. You know, there's a brand new technology that all the kids on the block are using that, you know, are making your website slow and, you know, you need to make it faster and better. There's a lot that's happening. There's a lot that's happening. And the most important thing is, is keeping up to, to, to date with these trends and these technologies um, and trying to see how we can use those trends and those technologies to better our clients. So like, you know, for us at Code Express, for example, every Friday we have a technology sharing session and basically everyone comes through and they're like, guys, I've worked on this awesome new thing. And I think it's applicable for our clients here. It's almost like a training day, if you will, you know, let everyone explore what they want to explore. Um, we work, you know, eight hours a day. And the only time you have to sort of explore something is in your own personal time. So why not give everyone the capability of working on things? in their time, in their office, and trying to see how it can better fit their, their, their day to day. So that's sort of what we do to, to keep up with the trends. Then the, the sort of other thing is scalability. You know, the biggest challenge is you have the software application, you know, it's gaining traction, it's gaining users, it's gaining momentum. How do you keep up with that? You know, how, you know, Coding Space is a tech partner. So it's not just, you know, you hire us, we work on your software application and that's it. No. We try and understand your business as a whole. We try and help your business from every single facet that we possibly can. And that's really what's separated us from, from your run of the mill software development companies where we'll partner on, you know, with you on different aspects, different needs. You know, we want to make sure that the decisions we make on tech, not only just helps your software application, but also helps your business. Um, so scalability is definitely one of those um, issues that you are constantly always trying to solve. And then in, in terms of if you want to get into software development, how do you get into software development uh, advice? Look, advice is if you love tech um, and you love everything around tech and associated with tech and you want to get involved in it, there's tons of free resources out there. Um, YouTube is often the best. Like I see my guys all the time when I come past these screens, they got YouTube on learning something continuously. They got podcasts on, you know, just exposing yourself to technology and seeing if it's a good fit for you, um, you know, go down the road, you know, do you want to do robotics? Do you want to do AI? Do you want to do machine learning? Do you want to do networking? Okay. You don't enjoy networking. You really enjoy design, go into design, 
but still have that underlining technological background that will help you. So yeah, expose yourself to as much as you can. And yeah, really never, never, ever stop learning. That's great advice. I know like, because technology is ever advancing, I think if anyone is passionate or, or really wants to, to get in technology, it's never too late because it's, yeah. it's just going to keep going and who knows what's, what's on the horizon. So Perfect. Dominic, if people want to get hold of you, where do they go? Do you have any socials? How can people contact you for either business or for followings or for maybe they want to chat to you about software development? Cool. I've got uh, Instagram. You can reach out to me on Instagram. Um, it is Dominic Santo. And yeah, I've got Twitter. It's also the same handle. Um, and then if you want to reach out to, to us at Code Express, it's uh, www.codeexpress.co. Awesome. Cool. Well, Dominic, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I learned heaps about software development. Okay. And I'm probably going to have to listen to this back to kind of properly understand exactly what goes into developing websites and mobile phones. So uh, from the Think Connect team, thank you very much for coming on the show. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. Cool. Cheers, eh? Bye. Cheers. For more news and content about Think Connect, go to www.thinkconnect.com or visit our Facebook or Instagram pages at Think Connect.